Welcome to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm absolutely delighted today to have as my guest, Dr. Ron Weiss. Uh, Dr. Weiss is a uh, medical physician that is board certified in lifestyle medicine and internal medicine, but he's noteworthy as being the founder of the Ethos Farm in Long Valley, New Jersey, a 342-acre farm, sustainable farm. Um, that's almost 300 years old and in a way he's pioneered this, this marriage of uh, sustainable farming and plant-based healthcare. Ron, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to meet you. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thank you, Frank. It's a joy to be here as well. I, I've been aware of your work for a long time, and 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 we have mutual friends that have been friends for decades that uh, have also, uh, you know, talked about and, and praised you to the heavens. Dr. Michael Clapper, Joel Furman, Colin Campbell. These are all right. friends for decades. So I'm I'm glad that we're finally having this opportunity to interface and meet. I am uh, too, and your reputation precedes you. Very well, much you. so, and I, I'm so glad I, I finally get to talk with you. You know, as I went through a little bit of your bio and some old interview that you did, I, you know, music has always been such a big part of my life, and I noticed that that was the first, that was your first language, and I found that really intriguing, that you learned to read music almost before you even were, uh, well, you know, reading English and speaking. Yeah, well, you know, when I, when I was a kid, people, uh, kids weren't taught to read until the first grade. And uh, I remember giving a concert in kindergarten uh, and, and played a little piece and read the music. So I, I guess so, yes. Well, and what what uh, what kind of instrument or what well, kind of I, I played I played mouth harp like in blues bands for years, but I did really? study a little violin, Indian flutes, that kind of thing. It, it's always been such a. In fact, I wanted my children to find it, and they found it in a big way. They're both kind of like indie rock musicians, composers. Wow. So now it's a rough life. I hope something works for them. <laughs> Are you still playing? Do you still play at all? Uh, yes. Well. Uh, I, most of my time, um, I spend uh, with my children because they're musicians. They're 15 and 17 years old. Beautiful. They go to a music school, so I, I play with them. And, and I, you know, I, I do practice a little bit at the piano. Um, yeah, I, when, I, when I looked at, at your history, you know, I, uh, like everybody that goes into something like healthcare or some kind of service work, I know you had an altruistic goal of, you know, going into medicine early on to help people like most people do. But I, I noticed that when in an interview that I read, you had to deal with the disappointment that you were given the information that you really doctors don't really see anybody get well from chronic care. They just need to be disease managers and hold people's hands while they suffer. And that was very disappointing to you. And that kind of was a motivation for your next set of your journeys. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so. Uh, I was quite shocked when, and when a professor at the beginning of the third year of medical school, you know, so the first two years of medical school, students spend with dead bodies and microscopes in the classroom with books, you know, and then in the third year, they actually go into the hospital and start, you know, taking care of patients. And at an orientation, um, bef the day before we set foot in the hospital and, and had contact with patients. I remember specifically being told this by a professor in front of the lecture hall that, that um, you know, he wanted to set things straight for us. And he told us that doctors really don't cure much of anything at all. He said, he says, and I don't want you to be disappointed, but what you will become is all the pharmacology and the medications you've learned about and everything you the physiology you'll be able to manage people's diseases and 
if you think about all the diseases that you've learned about, like diabetes and depression and heart disease, so on and so forth, there are very few that actually can be cured. And usually that's either an infection with antibiotics, and today less and less so, right. or, or something can be cut out by a surgeon and sometimes cured like that. Right. But, um, yeah, so um, I, was, uh, I was shaken because uh, I entered medical school wanted, wanting to be, as you said, a healer, which I think is the reason why most kids, why they fill out their medical school application. So it took, oh, many years until I finally understood that chronic disease can be reversed and it can be prevented and most importantly, and, per, and reversed with lifestyle. Right. Well, you know, R.D. Lang, many years ago, the psychiatrist from Scotland used to talk about the discipline of unlearning. So when you go through that kind of orientation, you think about the kind of unlearning that you have to unravel and dismantle to get to this vision of, you know, knowing that, well, wait a second, these things can be changed. They can be prevented and reversed. Absolutely. And, and, and I think, yeah. Do you interact with a number of medical students that are dealing with that same disappointment? Do you have input? Uh, on that kind of a dance in that picture? So, you know, I'm an assistant clinical professor of medicine at New Jersey Medical School, which is where I graduated from. And we have a month long rotation here at the farm and the farm practice. It, it, it's called, uh, and it's part of our nonprofit, which is called Ethos Farm Project. And it is, um, it's a month long rotation, as I said, where students from the medical school in their senior year. So after they've been exposed to the, right. the you know, the mill, uh, they come here and they learn for the first time and see patients getting better with whole plant foods, getting better with, um, you know, with uh, optimization of sleep and stress management. Right and movement and all these things and they are wowed and um you know i must say um fortunately and unfortunately i think we probably have a selected audience i think i think that the kids who come here pre-select themselves because they're looking for something like this and unfortunately i don't think we get to reach the vast majority i know we don't get to reach the vast majority of medical students at the school yeah, it's really tough, uh, and, and you're right. Um, many times people get involved in, in a lifestyle like this coming from their own you know, pathology and problems that they may be reckoned with, and we're looking for a different way to, to take care of it. In your case, it wasn't so much disease in your own life, I noticed, but some changes that went on in family members like your father that led you on kind of a, a journey through some very noteworthy people that were influential, like Andrew Weil and Michio Kushi with the macrobiotic movement. Yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about that journey for you and how that kind of, kind of fleshed out some of the ways that you started to really think about mm -hmm. things differently. Sure. Well, um, so as I said, um, you know, I was sort, I was crestfallen uh, in the beginning of that third year of medical school, but you know, I just plowed through it and I. I, because that's what I was taught. It was the only thing I knew. I had to give people drugs and send them the surgeries and do all kinds of screening. And, and, and so I did an academic um, residency in internal medicine at George Washington University. And I graduated and I, that's what I was doing until my father was diagnosed with end-stage pancreatic cancer. And at that point, you know, I knew that everything that I had been taught was useless because I'd taken care of a lot of these patients on the cancer wards at George Washington. I, I'm giving them chemo. They just died within six months to a year. And uh, we took him to uh, the best cancer hospital in the world. He was given, you know, three to six months to live and told to go home to get his affairs in order. They could give him the standard chemo at the time it was five fluorouracil, which would really have no effect on him. So we went home, I moved home 
to take care of him. And uh, I was desperate and he was desperate. And I went to our public library and I, that's, that's where I encountered books by Andrew Weil and sort of alternative uh, lines of thought, you know, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, you know, yoga. And, and, and I picked up one book, which was a book of testimonials of patients from Michio Kushi who had been on a macrobiotic diet. And one of them, whose name, last name was Arnold, uh, um, this was, I guess, in the, he had, his case had been in the early 80s. Um, he had had the same cancer as my father, and he had survived and, and cured himself of it. Uh, and his testimony was about how he did it with a, with a macrobiotic diet, which is a diet of, a certain diet of whole plant food. I brought home this book through, uh, to my father. And by the way, this man went on to live many years and founded the University of South Carolina School of Public Health. It's named after him today. Huh. He died about two or three years ago, actually elderly. And um, so my father was a ray of light uh, in, in, in this devastating time. My father received this, said, okay, I'm going to do it. We took him to see Michio Kushi. Michio Kushi looked at him um, and placed him on the most severe, insane diet I had ever seen. Yeah. I, I didn't know, I didn't think a human being could ever survive like this. It, it consisted, even by our whole food plant-based standards, it was extremely severe. It didn't allow any fruit. Uh, it consisted of dark leafy greens, a lot of them, mostly cruciferous, uh, a lot of legumes, brown rice, some other grains like buckwheat, no nightshade vegetables, and um, of course, no animal products. So in any event, he, we took him home. My mother was the foot soldier who cooked everything and rearranged our kitchen. And he blossomed in front of our eyes, got off all of his heavy narcotics within a couple of days. Uh, pain, you know, pancreatic cancer, severely painful. Pain vanished within a couple of days. Um, he went back to his law practice in about a week or so went back to the gym in a couple of weeks, was running in a few weeks. Uh, three months later, he had a one-third reduction, uh, as demonstrated by CAT scan, of his major tumor masses. And six months later, a 50% reduction. And a year later, we took him back to that cancer center where he was originally diagnosed. When the department chair saw him walk in, he, he looked shocked and he asked my father as to like what was going on while he was there. We brought him back to see maybe if there was any, any advances or any new, new therapies that had been developed. And uh, when my father started to tell him that he was alive because he was eating kale and brown rice and, and <laughs> carrots and seaweed and the doctor, the uh, doctor lost complete interest in the moment and just changed the subject and started talking about chemo. And that is the time when that moment on that day is when I decided I was going to change who I was as a physician because I knew I was not crazy. I'd taken care of my father. I'd seen this happen. I knew what he was doing and there was no other explanation for it. He wasn't, didn't take chemo. And, and people need to know, uh, because the audience may not know, that end-stage pancreatic cancer is one of the most dire prognoses, meaning that just a percentage or two people wind up surviving from that. So True. you're dealing you're dealing with a test situation under the most dire, dire circumstances yeah. to show the power of plant food. I mean, that was just really quite remarkable. Yeah. I'm, here with Dr. Yeah, I'm here with Dr. Ron Weiss. We're going to just take a few moments to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. 
simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is only $35 per year for those living within the United States and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication mailed to your home or offices, loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the extraordinary annual conference of the National Health Association and diverse opportunities for plant exclusive NHA cruises and travel vacations to exotic destinations around the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm here with uh, Dr. Ron Weiss from Ethos Farms. Yeah, Ron, I didn't mean to cut you off before. What were you going to say about the pancreatic thing? No, I, I wanted to say that, you know, my, my father's cancer was so advanced. I think he, he lived 18 months, a year and a half, um, instead of the, you know, the uh, few months that he was given. And the most important thing is, in addition to seeing this tumor shrink, he had an amazing quality of life. Uh, he felt better in that, except for the last couple of weeks, he felt better than he had for most <laughs> the decades preceding right. uh, his diagnosis. And he enjoyed what he did most, which was practice law, go to the gym, be with his family. So this, and, was, a, this was a big stimulus and a big aha moment for you, really, in your journey. It, it, it was, but not enough to change. I changed the way I practice medicine, but, but I, didn't, I didn't fully get it. Right. It took me another 15 years until one night uh, after the China study had come out, I read that book, well, actually over about three nights, late into the night, I closed that book and I was in my early forties by that time. So 15 years had passed. And I closed that book and said, I'm well that I know of, but I do not want to end up like my father. Um, I'd never been hospitalized, never taken any medicines. I said, after looking, you know, you have to remember at the time of my father, there was really little information as to how these things work. And the China study, I really began to understand why this had happened with my father, why he had reduced his cancer, uh, cancer his tumor size. And from that point on, I decided I would become whole plant foods and uh, I would not just be an integrative medicine doctor or an alternative medicine doctor. I would be a plant-based whole foods doctor pl practicing lifestyle medicine. And then how did you segue from that place in your life back to the land? Let's get into that, how you discovered the farm and how you went that next step yeah. and got back into your farming part of your life. So that's a, that is a, a bit of a, a complex, um, uh, a number of reasons and a number of um, inspirations all tied together. Uh, the first one was that I have always loved growing plants um, since I was a little kid. Um, and my mother started me on my, my first seeds I planted. Um, I went to Rutgers and got a, my undergraduate degree was in botany and piano performance. It was a dual degree. Um, and I had always wanted to be a farmer. My parents encouraged me to be a doctor, you know, so I could provide for myself. Um, but I always loved to grow things and I wanted to be a farmer. By the time I hit midlife, you know, I had recently married. We had had the two beautiful little children and um, I was being crushed to death. I, I had a, you know, I'd started off my career as an emergency room doctor 
And I did that for about seven years in a busy uh, urban ER. And then I opened up my own sort of little medical center in, in the most densely populated city in the United States. It's in northern Hudson County across from Manhattan. And um, it was very busy. We did everything there, primary care, multi-specialty care, urgent care. But uh, we were toasted by, I have to say, the insurers and the corporatization of healthcare. And no matter how hard we strive to give quality care, uh, we couldn't make ends meet. And uh, I tried to see more and more patients and I just got further and further into debt. And I began to suffer from what is today known as physician burnout syndrome. And the combination of this, this uh, early dream in my tender years, seeing my little children, seeing our planet withering in front of us. And I, I felt bad about that because, you know, I spent my life driving a lot of gas guzzling cars and, and doing things that contributed to the dire uh, situation of our earth. I decided to package all of these desires up with a big green bow, sold my struggling practice to a large corporation, took the money and decided to erase what I was doing and start again. But this time start with where food begins, which is the creation of a new food slash healthcare system. Because, you know, as I finally learned after my father's situation, uh, I found out that Hippocrates said that food was medicine. I'd never been taught that in medical school, even though I took the Hipp Hippocratic Oath. And finally, years later, I found that out. So I decided to take half that money, half the money I paid off all my loans that I'd taken out for payroll for my practice. And the other half I put as a de uh, deposit down on this um, permanently preserved ancient farm in, in New Jersey, about an hour west of Manhattan, and decided to start again uh, growing good food and then taking um, the regenerative techniques that we would use to renew the soil and transferring them that health through the plants to the patients. So that's what happened. Yeah, Ron, when you, as I go over some of the things you've spoken about, I want to talk about this because we know how important organic food is. The idea of remove, reducing pesticides and chemicals that really have no beneficial effect, in fact, harmful effects on the body. But you've made a you've made um, you've made a distinction in a way between just organic by itself and the idea of restorative and regenerative. So, for our audience, can you clarify what that that other level of nuance really means to sure. you? You know, by its very nature, farming is a is a mining operation. If you think about it, um, we plant crops in the ground and remove the, the food uh, at harvest. And that means that we are removing nutrients that came from the ground and, and shipping them somewhere else. So it's always important to remember uh, that in order to be not just sustainable, but to restore the land that you're using, you need to put those nutrients back. You need to put that organic matter back. I think the beautiful thing about what we do is that there's reciprocity. The reason why we're in such trouble is because we, uh, human beings tend to use up our resources without restoring them. And so what we wanted to do when we came to this farm, which was so old, um, uh, it was being conventionally farmed. We had a lot of GMO crops, a lot of pesticides were being sprayed here. 
and um, artificial fertilizers were being used to return some kind of bare nutrients to the soil, but the soil was eroded, was being washed away. There were monocrops, all of these pesticides and chemicals were going into the water and people were drinking it downstream. So we decided we would, we needed to, by reciprocity, restore the land and build up the soil in order to then give our community good food to eat. And, and, that's so, the re and that's the reason why you make a statement that because a food is organic, it may not be nutrient dense. I think everybody no. has that. Everybody has that misapprehension that if it's organic or a priori, no. it's loaded with nutrients. But that's not necessarily the case, no. as you point out. Exactly. So that idea and that word organic was coined by uh, uh, J.I. Rodale. Right. Uh, the founder of the Rodale Institute in the 1940s, he came up with that term. And um, in his conception of it, it was re it, it re organic meant regenerative. And his son, Robert, coined the word regenerative in the 1960s, 70s. And then the USDA came along in the late 70s and 80s and came to Rodale and asked if they could use that term. To, to create a, a, a procedure and a, a certification so that people could buy food that was certified organic. But what ended up happening was the standards were not as high as, as those that the Rodales envisioned. Um, they allowed organically certified pesticides, like pesticides, that are very broad spectrum that kill a lot of insects, but they come from like plants, but right. still are lethal. And today, the organic certification certifies crops that are not grown in soil at all. They're grown in water. And, you know, a, a, a lot of people in the organic farming community are up in arms about that. And when you buy this stuff, you can't tell. You can't tell if that's true or not. If, if they've been grown in water or in soil. Right. And, um, um, you know, I was, um, I was uh, talking on, you know, Chef AJ, right? Of course, yes. So I was on her show uh, last week and uh, we were talking about something called a new product called Appeal, uh, A-P-E-E-L. And basically what it is, it's, it, it is an organically approved substance, which is now being used to coat organic vegetables. It's made out of di, uh, diglycerides, monoglycerides and triglycerides, which have trans fats in them and which are emulsifiers that disrupt the basis of our health, which is our gut uh, microbiome. And um, you wouldn't know you're eating them. And that's under, that's under the guise of protecting the plant? Is or, that what that's? No, to allow uh, the organic produce. And by the way, there's a, there's a non-organic version too uh -huh. of Appeal, A-P-E-E-L. But it allows the produce to sit on the shelf longer. I see, for shelf life. Okay. Yes, it increases the shelf life. And, you know, I, there are subtle... You know, it's hard to say everything is all good or all bad. You know, one of the things this appeal does is it decreases food waste. Right. The you know, food waste is an enormous contributor to climate change. Right. But on the other hand, it undermines local agriculture, local and, and agriculture and certainly healthy food. Uh, if you're eating all these, uh, these emulsifiers, that's not good. Not so good. in any event, that's an example. So what has happened is the Rodale Institute, who, by the way, uh, sits on the board of our uh, nonprofit, the Ethos Farm Project, which we can talk about a little bit later if you want. Yeah, but, absolutely. But uh, so um, they have come up with a regenerative certification. So in order to get that certification, first, you, you must be organic certified as a, as a farmer. And then you can go for their certification. 
And their exactly. certification doesn't allow some of these loopholes. Uh, actually, these all of these loopholes. I'm here with Dr. Uh, Ron Weiss from Ethos Farms. Uh, Ethos Farm. Ron, let people know how they can learn more about the farm and your work. What, where can they go online to do that? Sure. So, um, so we have two websites. Um, the farm's website is ethosfarmproject.org, and um, we have a primary care um, lifestyle medicine practice right in the center of the growing fields of this 300-year-old farm, um, and that is my private practice. It's called ethosprimarycare.com. We treat all people from uh, fetuses that have not been born yet to uh, super centenarians uh, who, who seek to improve their life prevent disease and reverse illness uh, with lifestyle medicine. Um, uh, I, I, if anyone is um, listening and is interested, we have a, uh, an, a, an amazing festival, which is about to occur. It occurs on September 9th and 10th here on the farm. We open up the entire farm and uh, 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 many, many people come from not only the tri-state area, but all over the country. We have, um, you know, thought leaders and the pioneers in, in, in lifestyle medicine, environment, nutrition, uh, athlet, ath uh, athletics coming here. And, um, you know, um, it's going to be a great event. I encourage you all to come. You can find out about it by going to the website. Ron, let me ask you a question. Both here and in Europe, there was uh, the concept that was set up by Rudolf Steiner and some of his followers on biodynamic farming. Do you put any stock in that in addition to what you're doing? Or how do you, how do you view that? Because they're, they're dealing with planting by phases of the moon and, and harvesting things under certain conditions. Do you find any stock of any value in that? Uh, we do not plant by the phases of the moon. Um, you know, uh, however, um, you know, there, there are different flavors of farming. And that, that just like we talked about before about, um, about the macrobiotic diet. Right. Um, that is a flavor of a, a plant-based diet. The uh, biodynamics, which is the Rudolf Steiner school of thought, is a flavor of regenerative agriculture. Right. It is. It, it is a very wonderful uh, pursuit and philosophy. We don't utilize that there. Here, uh, we sort of have our own style of finding our own way. Right. And it is, I guess, a combination of many different philosophies. Uh, one of those philosophies are we we try to adhere to the rights of nature. Right. on this farm, which means that uh, all beings have equal rights to exist in this world, uh, not to be abused or not to be taken advantage of. So we, our farming practices revolve around that, as well as we actually focus on growing soil health. And then when we grow soil health, that grows our plant health. Uh, we focus on sequestering carbon in the soil, which helps, you know, climate change. So um, we do all of these things and, you know. Yeah, I want to get deeper into that uh, Ethos Farm Project, Ron, because I, when I read about it, I love the three-pronged approach that you have. For example, mentoring young farmers and turning them on to regenerative methods. The way you were going at, as you just mentioned, planting prairie grasses that really existed on the land that you have hundreds of years ago so that they would be more actively able to sequester carbon deeper into the soil and then your farm day project. So speak to that three-pronged approach a little bit more in depth so people really get an idea of how really incredible and valuable this Ethos Farm Project is. Thank you so much for saying that, Frank. It's very kind of you. So uh, the Ethos Farm Project actually has four initiatives. Okay. Uh, uh, the fourth one is what we talked about before, which is educating the public. And right. that's what um, our uh, farm days 
event in, on September 9th and 10th, uh, we think is glorious, so exciting. And, and that's the, uh, it's reincarnated every year and, and I invite everyone to come to that. Um, so that's one of our initiatives. The, the two of the other initiatives are called Next Gen Farmers Program and Next Gen Physicians Program. Uh -huh. I spoke a little bit about that before where we, uh, I'm a professor at the medical school, assistant clinical professor, and we host medical students here on the farm and interns and residents uh, and teach them lifestyle medicine and teach them about regenerative food systems and how they're connected and connected to the health of the planet. So uh, the, the Next Gen Farmers program is uh, where we do the same thing with young farmers. We're in a desperate situation because um, our farmers population in the United States is aging and uh, near retirement. And a lot of these regenerative techniques must be handed down from person to person. Um, and so uh, our next gen farmers program takes young people who want to learn how to farm and they farm here. They stay with us at least for a year and um, hopefully more, and they learn how to be um, top-notch farmers uh, utilizing these regenerative techniques. Um, and then uh, the sort of most amazing, uh, one of the most amazing aspects of the Ethos Farm Project, as you referred to, is has to do with those prairie grasses. So we, we, our farm is in the middle of this very green valley, uh, which contains 42 preserved farms just in our town alone. Thousands and thousands of permanently preserved prime soils, some of the richest in the United States. And the reason why these soils were so good is because the Lenape, the native people who were here for 10,000 years, uh, cultured this valley as a prairie as a grasslands, it was their hunting ground. And for thousands and thousands of years, they would set rings of fire here to make sure that it didn't turn into a forest. And so we have restored the, our section of the valley by reintroducing those exact same plants, those prairie grasses, they're four species, Indian grass, big blue stem, little blue stem, and switchgrass. And um, the one, the, there are many reasons why they're so wonderful, but they, they're champions at sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere and burying it for a long time down deep into the soil. And they also build soil life. They renew the soil. Um, and so that program where we, we took most of our farm and did that is called the Ethos Farm Ecosystem and Carbon Trial Effect. E-F-E-C-T. And it is a partnership between the Rodale Institute, us, Princeton University, and Rutgers University to study in a life cycle analysis what happens when you take GMO corn and soy land that's all tired out and you restore it with these beautiful native grasses, tracking the carbon from the sky to the soil, to the plant, to the food, through the community, and what happens, how it revives community, revives our health. So we are seeking funding for this um, uh, life cycle analysis because we think it's important. It'll answer uh, many questions that we have uh, as to how to grow good food in a sustainable and regenerative manner. And how long that project, the, the sequestration project has been going on for how long, right? About three, four years? Uh, well, uh, the first stage of it, it was funded by the USDA through a natural resource conservation service grant. And that uh, it, we are in our third year of that. It's a five year grant. So uh, we've we've gotten uh, 200 soil core samples of the original soil, which was very depleted before we started. So our next stop will be to get at the end of the five year period, another set and compare to see what the, these grasses did.
And there's no question that, you know, getting away from all animal food production and enhancing these sequestration projects are going to be the salvation for the climate changes on the earth. Absolutely. You know and it's the only way that it's going to change. Absolutely. And the exciting thing about it, you know, I know these are sometimes very bleak times, but they're bright spots everywhere. You know, the, the USDA, right? The USDA funds things like this through their conservation service. I mean, if it weren't for that, the, that conservation grant, we wouldn't have ever been able to afford to do this. And it's my dream that someday this could act as a model for the hundreds of millions of acres that we have growing this feed corn and soybean, right? Which goes right. to create this highly ultra processed and animal based food system that we have and, you know, and turn it over, you know, regenerate all these hundreds of millions of acres. And, you know, hopefully our government can help with that. Absolutely. I think that's fantastic. Um, Ron, do you make uh, the food that you grow? I know that your place is completely sustainable. Is that correct? Um, well, when you mean sustainable, and, and, you know. Um, I mean, do you have to shop for any food or can you eat off your oh, land? And say that? Oh, sure we do. Uh, yeah, that's all I so mean. We grow, yeah, sure we do. So we're not, we're not there 100% yet. Okay. You, you know, we've only been here for about 10 years. I got it. Our dream is to one day grow in New Jersey, right? Where it gets down to be, well, 10, five degrees sometimes or zero degrees. Right. A uh, full whole food plant-based diets, regeneratively produced uh, 365 days a year. And we can do that, but, you know, we need a lot of help. That uh, We need a lot of help. And, you know, we're, we're, getting there a little bit, little bit year by year. So currently we grow about 80 different varieties of produce, oh, whole, of, of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. And um, so uh, our season is at this time is open from late April until after Thanksgiving. And, and do, we, you sell, do you sell any of that commercially to the local area? Or how we does do. That we yeah. have our, we have a, it's called the doctor's farm market. Oh, cool. And it's Beautiful. open to the public and anyone is welcome to come here on, on Fridays and Saturdays. We also take a portion of our food and donate it to Montclair Farms, which is a nonprofit who, uh, that helps to uh, feed the food insecure in Montclair, New Jersey. What a myth for that all is. That's beautiful. I mean, seriously. Well, so, Ron, as we wind this down, are there any final words you'd like to share with the audience out here? Um, yes. Um, so, I think it's important. <laughs> the, the food that you eat is important. Like Hippocrates said, I, I learned this late, later in my career, food is medicine. And food is medicine in all of its, from all of its perspectives. And that includes eating food that is not served with a side of poison. Dr. Sabatino, I think we all, a lot of us, try very hard and go through long lengths and, and put a lot of focus on the food that we eat. Why, you know, why not eat food at the same time that's grown well? And when I say grown well, it just doesn't have, it's clear of pesticides, but is highly nutrient dense and was grown to restore our planet. So I think those three things, when you think about what's on the end of your fork, if everyone can think about that, that would be my, my um, exiting sort of suggestion. For this interview. I love it. I'm, I'm, uh, I really want to thank Dr. Ron Weiss for being my guest today. Thank you for sharing your vision, your work. The stuff that you're doing is such a, an incredible blessing for the planet. It really is. And I urge uh, everyone that's watching, listening to please follow Ron. His uh, location will be in our show notes. He's having a, an incredible farm day retreat, September 9th and 10th in New Jersey. If there's any way you can get there, I would urge you to follow through and go there. And by the way, Dr. Sabatino, if you can't get here, 
We also have uh, it's live remotely. Oh, beautiful. You so can they join can do, us that way. They can do remote attendance. So please yeah. take advantage of all of that. I urge you uh, strongly to do that. And I really want to thank all the people that are out there that joined us today. Without you, we couldn't do what we do. I want to thank you for being part of this incredible, healthy and active and vibrant community. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.